Okay, so um, look, I think, um, I, you know, I, I'll describe heart failure to all of you who are probably experts from having experienced it, but um, it, so, you know, pardon me if this is kind of remedial, um, you know, telling you things you already know, but you know, what, what heart failure is uh, just very broadly <clears throat> is, you know, since it's the organ that um, is meant to, you know, pump blood and, and give your body oxygen, um, what heart failure is, is that it, it's just unable to um, pump enough to meet the body's needs. Um, and, you know, and since your entire body depends upon oxygen and, you um, it depends upon the, um, the the blood that your heart gives. Um, it can, you know, a failure of the heart can disrupt everything. And, um, you know, here on the right side, what I'm showing is, is just some of the major body systems that can be affected. And so, for instance, um, if the left side of your heart <clears throat> um, is failing, um, that backup of pressure of, of, uh, of excess blood into the lungs over time can lead to um, the, the lungs to, the, the blood vessels in the lungs to kind of clamp down that causes what's called pulmonary hypertension, which I think as many of you know, is, is just means high blood pressure inside the lungs. Um, and, and that can cause the right side of the heart to fail because that's what the right side of the heart pumps against. Um, backup of blood either on the right side and or um, because there's not enough blood flow going forward on the on the left side um, can cause the kidneys to fail, both because they're not getting enough blood and because there's too much blood backing up. Um, and, you know, lastly, the major, the last big system um, that's uh, affected is uh, the liver. Um, and often that's because <clears throat> there's just too much pressure backing up on the right side. Um, that's kind of back flowing into the liver. It gets congested. And over time, it can actually become, you know, really advanced. Um, people can develop cirrhosis uh, of the liver um, because the, the heart is so bad. Um, you know, there are other things like, um, you know, the, the, the weakness of the heart muscle can cause weakness of all the other muscles in your body. You can become, can develop what's called uh, cachexia. Um, and, but yet those are the major systems and, and some of the symptoms that I think some of you may know about that, that result from this derangement include, you know, uh, just being tired all the time, gaining weight, usually because you've, um, you're putting on fluid, although at the, on the opposite end, you could actually start losing weight. Um, they get, you know, as I mentioned, because your, your, your muscles aren't getting enough blood flow. Um, and you are, um, you know, you start losing um, weight that way because you're losing muscle mass. Um, you might be losing your appetite because um, of uh, backup of, of blood into the circulation of your, uh, of your gut. Um, and that congestion leaves you uh, sometimes unable to eat. Um, coughing, especially when you lay down, that, that backing up of, of pressure into the lungs can cause you to cough. Irregular heart rate, uh, heartbeats, um, or rhythm, I should say. Um, often atrial fibrillation is something that we see um, as the bottom of the heart, um, you know, becomes congested over time. It, it exerts pressure on the top of the heart, um, and that the heartbeat can become irregular. Um, you can develop palpitations, often resulting from the irregular heart rate. Abdominal swelling due to uh, backup of fluid shortness of breath, um, really due to the, the same mechanisms, and leg and ankle swelling, again, that's largely because of fluid. Um, and the, the major types of heart failure are um, what we call systolic heart failure, which means that you know, there, there are two major phases of the heart cycle. Systole, which is when the heart squeezes blood out, and diastole, when the heart relaxes to allow new blood to come in. And you can have problems in both of those uh, phases. Uh, so in the systolic heart failure category, the, the 
the heart is too weak to push blood forward um, during systole. It's like being able to, it's like going to the gym and you go pick up a heavy weight and you're just not strong enough to lift it. Um, in, dia in diastolic heart failure, um, the, the heart squeeze is fine, but the, it's just, it, it can't allow much new blood to come in. And, you know, I, I, I guess that would be, the, the analogy might be those, um, sometimes you see these guys who are so muscular that they can barely, you know, use their arms for anything. They just kind of walk around like this. And, and that's, um, can be what, you know, diastolic heart failure is. It's, it's just the heart's too stiff. As well, you can have um, kind of isolated um, failure on one side of the heart versus the other. Um, you can have an isolated left side heart failure, um, and that primarily causes issues with, um, uh, you know, your, your lungs get flooded with fluid because it's backing up. Um, there are issues with um, not enough blood flow reaching the major organs like the kidneys. You can also have right-sided heart failure where the major kind of um, symptoms, at least early on, are, are just of congestion, primarily swelling um, of, of uh, you know, the, the, the liver uh, being harmed by too much backflow. Um, and there are different ways to, you know, a, a address those, um, whether it's systolic versus diastolic or left versus right-sided. Um, and we can kind of talk about that a, a, a bit more when we talk about advanced therapy and, and the different considerations for, for both of those. In terms of the major causes, obviously one of the major ones, um, especially in this kind of westernized, western diet, um, you know, modern America, is uh, ischemia. And, and that's just a fancy word that means the heart's not getting enough blood flow. That could be because, um, you've actually had a heart attack. Um, there's an acute event where the arteries became blocked and heart muscle dies off. Um, it could also just be to just a chronic um, insufficiency of blood flow. There, there are blockages um, in the arteries. They're not completely blocked, but the flow is so slow that the heart just chronically can't get enough blood. Um, the, in, in the way hopefully assuming that too much muscle hasn't died off is to try to either open up those blockages or do a surgery where you bypass them. You, you put in, you use your own arteries to go around the blockage. Um, you can have diseases of the, of the valve. So for instance, of the, the mitral valve or the aortic valve, either that they're too stiff or that they're too uh, floppy and they're letting blood go backward. Um, and that can not only be a cause of heart failure, but, you know, in, in, the, in the case of, say, mitral, um, mitral regurgitation um, can actually be a consequence of heart failure. As the left side of the heart uh, becomes dilated, gets too big, it stretches the um, kind of the frame of the mitral valve and, and the valve starts leaking. Um, and so these things can kind of feed on each other. There are some uh, disorders of uh, what are called infiltration, where something that doesn't belong in the heart starts to get in there. Um, one that you may have started to hear about more and more um, is amyloidosis, um, in part because um, A, we're becoming better at diagnosing it, and B, uh, because we, at least for some types of amyloidosis, um, we you know, now have treatments that we didn't have before. Um, sarcoidosis um, is, a, is an immune uh, disease that can lead to deposits of, of uh, immune cells in various organs, including the heart. Um, some people can have, um, have a disorder called hemochromatosis where you deposit iron in, in the heart and that can cause weakness of the heart over time. And there are other, you know, genetic uh, issues like Fabre's disease, the glycogen storage disorders where um, other um, materials that are native to the body um, just get deposited abnormally inside the heart. 
and, and there may be some treatments for, for some of those. Um, there are viral infections and um, that can cause weakness of the heart muscle. And to be honest, I think that's probably more common than we realize. Um, and, and for people who have, um, you know, weakness of the heart that we just can't figure out why it is, it, probably a number of those people actually have viral infections that just weren't caught, uh, but we can't, you know, detect, um, you know, what caused it. Congenital heart disease, and that's a, a big area. Someone was born with an abnormality of the heart, whether it be some part of the heart just didn't grow, there, there are holes in the heart, there are issues with the valves, that, um, you know, over time, um, and, and because we've gotten better and better at treating congenital heart disease, some of these folks make it into adulthood and now have a failing heart that needs to be replaced or, um, you know, needs uh, mechanical mechanical heart. Uh, there are chemicals like um, for someone who's had uh, cancer, who've been treated with chemotherapy, certain chemotherapy agents can cause heart failure. Um, certainly alcohol, uh, heavy alcohol use over a long period of time. And, and some drugs like, uh, like cocaine um, certainly can contribute to, uh, to weakness of the heart. The rhythm disorders, as I mentioned, that can both be that heart failure can cause those rhythm disorders, but the other way around is that those rhythm disorders can cause heart failure. Um, diseases of the thyroid, particularly uh, hyper overactive thyroid. Um, genetics, the uh, various um, genetic um, uh, kind of syndromes, and then uh, immune disorders, um, including sarcoid, which I've mentioned, including um, lupus and, and a number of other uh, immune diseases in which really the treatment is to treat the immune disorder uh, and hope that the heart failure gets better. Sometimes it doesn't, and we still have to consider the advanced therapies. Um, in terms of how we treat heart failure, uh, the, you know, primarily if there's a particular um, underlying issue that we can identify, the, the, the primary thing is to treat that issue. And so, as I mentioned in the case of ischemia, if there's still some heart muscle that's alive, um, but isn't getting enough blood flow, it would be to, to try to put in a stent if that's appropriate, or to um, do a bypass operation called a cabbage, um, coronary artery bypass grafting. Um, there can be um, either surgery or these days, increasingly, um, a, a, a procedure in the cath lab where you intervene on the valve, either by trying to repair it or by putting in a brand new valve. Um, you know, managing uh, rhythm. Um, so for people who have atrial fibrillation that's contributing to a weak heart or um, you know, ventricular tachycardia, uh, trying to manage the rhythm to, to keep it under control so that gives the heart a chance to try to maybe regain some strength. Um, controlling thyroid disease, stopping the production of toxins or stopping toxins. So, you know, stopping the chemotherapy agent that may be causing it. And hopefully there are options to switch to a different agent. Um, stopping alcohol use, stopping drugs and stopping the produ production of, of, you know, the, the protein or other um, item that's kind of infiltrating the heart. So in the interest of, in the instance of amyloid, um, stopping the production of that by, if it's um, a particular protein produced by the liver, stopping the liver from producing that, um, or there's some cancers that can cause amyloidosis, it's, it's treating the cancer. In terms of the medications, you know, we now have um, increasingly a number of options uh, to treat heart failure that we didn't have in the past. And you know, there are four major classes that are kind of, um, that we use them because they're, we, we've done a number of studies that show that these drugs not only make people feel better, but they make them live longer. Uh, and those include um, medicines that I'm sure many of you have heard of um, called beta blockers. Those include carvedilol or Coreg, uh, metoprolol, XL or Toprol, um, there's a, a medicine called bisoprolol that we use less commonly, but those are those three are the, the approved FDA approved medicines for, for heart failure. 
There are medicines called mineralocorticoid receptor antagonists um, like spironolactone or aldactone, um, aplerinone or inspra. Um, there are medicines, this is all kind of a, a, a broad family of medicines called ACE inhibitors, um, ARBs or angiotensin receptor blo blockers, or a new, the newest class called ARNIs, um, or really only one drug in the class, the angiotensin receptor blocker and neprilysin inhibitor. Um, so just to back up and explain that, um, or, or mention that a bit better, it, it used to be that the, the major class that we used to treat um, heart failure were ACE inhibitors. ACE stands for angiotensin converting enzyme. And to the, the long and short of it is really all of those medicines, you could recognize them because they all ended in pril, lisinopril, um, benazapril, enalapril, ramipril. Um, and really those were the standard of, of um, care for you know, a very long time. Related to those um, were these medicines called angiotensin receptor blockers or ARBs. And those you can recognize because they ended in sartan, low sartan, um, val sartan, um, a, a number of them. And um, we often use them as just an alternative if somebody couldn't tolerate um, the, the, the ACE inhibitors. So sometimes people would develop a cough because of the ACE inhibitor or they'd have an angioedema, the swelling of the lips and, and um, that could be life-threatening, and so we'd switch them to the ARB. Well, you know, within the past, um, within the past decade, um, along came interest in this newer class that, um, this ARNI that consists of um, the ARB, a Sartan, plus um, a neprilysin inhibitor. Um, the, I, I can go into the details if some of you are interested later about those pathways, but to make a long story short, what the data have shown is that uh, the, the ARNI or Entresto is the only medicine in that class is superior to, um, to ACE inhibitors, which again have been the um, previously the standard of, of therapy. And so Entresto is really our go-to um, drug now in that class if people can tolerate it. And then lastly, the, the very newest um, uh, class of, of medicines that are guideline-based are the SGLT2 inhibitors. And these interestingly are, are medicines that were initially um, designed to treat diabetes. And what we found is that they actually help with heart failure, even if you don't have diabetes. And um, you know, we're seeing for people on all four who can tolerate all four of these medicines, you know, some people have a very dr dramatic um, response and, and can get a, a, a big increase in their, um, their heart function. Uh, and for some people, actually go, it goes back to normal. Now, that, that doesn't mean that you can stop the medicines. It means that it's normal on those medicines. Um, there are medicines that are not really guideline-based, but we use them because it makes sense. Um, so diuretics um, for volume control, uh, furosemide, also known as Lasix, Persimide, known as Dimidex, and, and Metolazone can be an add-on medicine for people who need a little extra help on top of those, um, the furosemide and torsemide. For some people who become refractory to all that therapy and maybe are just not yet ready for to talk about um, surgeries and, and uh, things, um, those folks who might think about um, for putting them on um, intravenous, what are called inotropes, Milrinone, dibutamine, dopamine, and someone may actually go home with a, an IV line and they get this medicine around the clock at home. Uh, and lastly, there's a medicine that we don't, we don't use as much anymore because of you know, toxicities, but uh, a medicine called digoxin. Um, there are devices that we uh, use to either to protect somebody or sometimes to improve their heart function. Those include a defibrillator because people with Heart failure can be at risk of um, deadly heart rhythms. Um, sometimes we put in an extra wire uh, on the defibrillator to do what's called resynchronization. Uh, and that can sometimes improve the heart function. Um, just kind of hot off the presses, there's a, um, a study called Guide HF that shows um, implanting a, a, a sensor in the pulmonary artery, which kind of senses 
whether there's pressure building up uh, on the left side of the heart, that's associated with better outcomes um, for, uh, for, for people with heart failure. Um, and then, you know, what we call the advanced therapies, um, those are um, left ventricular assist device and heart transplant, which we'll talk about, um, talk about more. Um, and this is just a picture of the left ventricular assist device or the LVAD. Um, uh, th this is the newest um, kind of iteration of, of these artificial hearts um, that is implanted completely in the chest. Um, but you do have a um, kind of a cable that comes out of the stomach and is connected to a, um, a, 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 a controller which is itself con connected to batteries that you would take with you if you're out and about. When you're at home, you know, going to sleep at night, um, you plug into the wall and it recharges, um, or it, it, it recharges the batteries. Um, so what are the indications for advanced cardiac therapy for those of you who may be thinking about either transplant or left ventricular assist device? It's having um, class three or four heart failure. And just to explain that, that means that um, you're having significant limitations to your ability to really do anything. And, and perhaps even when you're just sitting in a chair, you're just feeling overcome by, by the, the symptoms of the heart failure. Um, or that you, you may be so sick that you can't even really get out of bed. Obviously, that's somebody who... If we don't do something, um, their, uh, clearly their quality of life is gonna be pretty poor and they may not live very long. And to get some objective measures of you know, whether this is a person who we should be thinking about, um, you know, the, kind of the gold standard is what we call um, uh, exercise, uh, um, a cardiorespiratory um, exercise test. And we put that person on the treadmill and we see that their peak oxygen consumption is low. Um, uh, alternatively, if they can't even do that, we might do a six minute walk and see that they can walk less than 300 meters. Um, other indications might be that they can't even tolerate the, all those medicines that I just told you about because their blood pressure um, sinks or their, their kidneys get worse. Um, if they, you give them diuretics and it, you can't get the volume off, you can't keep it off, um, the kidneys are just getting worse, um, uh, even, even if they can tolerate the, the medicines from a blood pressure standpoint, but the kidneys are getting worse. Um, they keep coming into the hospital, even though they're taking their medicines faithfully, but it is, you know, they can't stay out of it. They need an inotrope. They're having um, rhythm issues that are um, life-threatening or their, their defibrillators discharging. Um, they're having angina, so chest pain. Um, and even though they've been revascularized as best as you can. They've had stents or bypass surgery, but um, the, the, you know, the chest pain is very limiting. Or you use one of these survival scores, which I won't go into, but it, you know, if you get a score that says this person's high risk for dying in the near future, that's something you wanna, somebody you wanna try to help, try to, you know, again, get them a, a trans on the transplant list or get them a, an LVAD. One of the reasons why we might say that this is somebody who maybe is not appropriate for uh, this type of therapy, well, you know, they've been, you know, not adherent for one reason or another. Um, they've just not been able to take, not been able to um, faithfully adhere to the therapy we're, we're prescribing for them. Um, they have, and that's important, especially because when you put a heart in somebody, it's very important that they are able to take their rejection medicines every single day, um, the way that it's prescribed, or they'll reject the organ. And what that means is not only are, are they going to be in trouble, um, they might die now because they don't have a functioning heart. It also means that somebody who could have gotten that heart, who would have been better able to take care of it, that person um, may pass away for for. And so it's just really, un and also to the donor who that donor or their family gave this organ in, 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 in good faith that it would be used properly. It's just unfair to everyone all the way around. Um, active substance use, um, which can in, in interfere with somebody's ability to adhere to therapy. 
um, if they've had, you know, strokes recently, um, you know, which al also might suggest that they even on blood thinners um, with an LVAD might still have problems with blood clotting or they can't tolerate blood thinners because they've had this recent stroke and there's a risk of it converting to a bleed in the brain. Um, severe dysfunction of other organs, and I'll say that with an asterisk because, um, you know, somebody who has um, severe pulmonary hypertension or COPD, emphysema, somebody who has um, uh, kidney failure uh, or who has liver failure, it's actually possible that um, they might be appropriate for um, transplant of multiple organs. So a heart plus a kidney or a heart plus a lung, a heart plus uh, liver. Um, but, you know, those criteria are more stringent. Um, the, the age restrictions are, are much more stringent um, for those double organs. Um, active infection, active, you know, uncontrolled mental illness, um, inadequate social support, fear, fixed severe pulmonary hypertension. Again, you know, left-sided heart failure can cause pulmonary hypertension. Problem is, if we can't reverse the pulmonary hypertension with medicines. If we put now a brand new heart in, in a body with, with severe pulmonary hypertension, the right side of that heart, which is going to push against that pressure from the lungs, if it's never seen that type of pressure before, the concern is that the right heart will just fail. It'll give up and say, I can't do this. And so um, we obviously we don't want that situation. Um, Obesity, uh, you know, with a BMI of greater than 35 is, is considered a contraindication to, um, at least for transplant, not so much for LVAD, but for transplant, because it's, it's associated with worse outcomes. Um, and then usually, you know, most transplant centers, at least ones that I've been familiar with, they have an age cutoff for transplant of, a, you know, around 70. Um, some might have, you know, some may go up to like 72. Um, for LVAD, um, all transplant centers are, I mean, centers are becoming more and more relaxed in terms of um, allowing people of an older age to get um, LVADs as destination therapy because there may be 80 year olds um, or even older who are still very functional, still have a lot of life left and a lot of quality. Um, they, but their heart just won't cooperate. And if you put an LVAD in them, they get their life back. And, and so that's a great thing. Um, someone who has had cancer recently um, that was just recently cured, um, and we're not sure whether it's completely cured or if it's active and hasn't been cured yet. And then, you know, an inability to tolerate um, the medicines that would be needed after an LVAD or after a transplant. Uh, this is a long list of, um, I think certainly Ms. Gloria can, you know, attest to all the, 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 the testing and um, visits and, and, you know, exams and all that type of stuff that, you, you know, you have to go through to, to, get, to get on the list. Um, um, but it's a lot. We do it, again, because we want to make sure that, A, that the person is appropriate for it, B, that there's not something in the you know, about them that would, would make it um, difficult for them to either to take care of the heart or the, or the pump, um, or that um, we also wanna make sure that when we put say a new heart in this person, that their immune system is going to play nicely um, with the new heart. Um, and so the right blood type, um, and, and that they don't have too many antibodies that are gonna attack this brand new heart. Um, with all of that information, um, generally what will happen is your doctor, um, the doctor who's been treating you for heart, trans, uh, for, for heart failure, will bring all of that information to the, the team. And that's a team that consists of um, heart surgeons, um, other heart failure doctors, nurses, transplant coordinators, social workers, financial coordinators. And we talk through all of the issues that, you know, are, are going on with you and try to decide what's the right thing to do. 
Um, we, we, that generally comes up at a, at, a, at a team meeting. And what we decide is that there are four possibilities. A, we say that <clears throat> this person um, should go to transplant. They need to be put on the list and we ought to try to get them uh, a heart as soon as possible. B, we say, okay, we would, we like, we'd like to list them. There's just a couple minor issues that need to be sorted out. So we're gonna say provisionally accepted as long, you know, once we just check off a couple more boxes. Um, C, we say, uh, look, there are other, there are some major things going on right now. Um, we think if possibly those could get settled, um, that you know, we'd follow up and, and see if we can reconsider it at a future point in time. Or D, we say, look, we, this is just not appropriate. Um, you know, this person probably is never really going to be suitable for um, transplant. Um, and alongside all of these, um, uh, these decisions um, are the, the possibility of using an LBAD either as a bridge to transplant, because let's say we think this person really needs transplant, but we don't think that we can get them a transplant fast enough to save their life. And either because they have a rare, they, they, their blood, they, they have an O blood type, which might be tough to match. They have lots of antibodies. They were a very big person, a big body size that might be tough to find an organ big enough. A variety of things. They're in a, an area of the country that is maybe tough to get organs. And so what we want to do is to, in order to keep them safe, put in an LVAD so, just so that we protect them until an organ becomes available. Um, or we say, um, you know, maybe there's somebody that we say, um, you know, we want to look out for this person. We don't necessarily think they're right for transplant right now. We want to keep following them. We might put in an, an LBAD as a, a bridge to candidacy to say, like, let's stabilize them, see that they get all these other issues ironed out, and then, um, and then come back and say, now we want to try to get your transplant, um, you know, and, and take out the LBAD. Or we might say, look, the, this is somebody who might benefit from a, an LBAD as a destination because maybe they're 80 years old. They're, they're too old to be transplanted but they could get you know, a lot of use out of an LVAD. Or we might just say they're not suitable for either transplant or LVAD. So those are the, those are the possibilities. Um, in the past few years, there's been a major change in how we um, decide the urgency. You know, they, they're, not a, they're not enough parts to go around um, for everybody who needs one at this moment. And so, you know, people are placed on a waiting list and how high up you're, you're placed on the list, it depends on essentially how sick you are. Uh, so if you're somebody who is in a hospital and you're on like essentially a full bypass machine um, because you can't survive without it, um, or you're having a, a life-threatening, you're in persistent, say VT, ventricular tachycardia, we can't get you out of it. You know, you're somebody who we say like, needs to be at the very top of the list. We need to get you an organ as fast as we can or you will pass away. Um, I, I won't go through all the rest of these unless you're interested, but, but they're, basically there are tiers of, uh, of urgency. Um, and th the other thing that determines where you are on the list is how long you've been waiting. And so the longer you've been waiting, the higher up you are. Um, where you're on the list, of course, determines how long you have to wait going forward. One of the other things that, that determines that is in addition to things that we've already talked about, like how big you are, which means if you're a big person, it might take longer to find a heart big enough for you. Um, things like antibodies and blood type. Um, the other thing is, is geography. Um, the uh, United Network for Organ Sharing essentially carves the country up into 11 different regions um, for, um, and, and each of those, those regions can have differences in terms of waiting time. Uh, Georgia is in region three, which includes um, 
you know, Florida, Alabama, um, Mississippi, Louisiana, and Arkansas, and also Puerto Rico. Um, I, I, I'm brand new to Georgia, at least a couple of months, so I'm not quite sure where we are relative to other uh, regions of the country, but there's some like, you know, Region 5, California, which traditionally has had fairly low wait times, and say Region 9, uh, New York, where I just came from, um, which traditionally has had very, very long wait times. Um, one thing, and if I could put in a plug for some um, of the work I've done previously, one thing they'll let you know about is because of those inequalities in terms of access to transplant, one of the things that um, the United Network for Organ Sharing allows is something called multiple listing, which means that um, you potentially can be on the wait list at different institutions at the same time. You could be on the wait list at Emory and also at say, um, Mayo Clinic in Jacksonville and um, you know, uh, Cedar sinai in, in Los Angeles. Um, a, a study I did a few years ago um, looked at, um, you know, one thing we were actually interested in is, is whether this was a fair thing, but putting that aside for the moment, what we saw is that it, it, it really seems to work. Um, people who, you know, are able to, um, you know, get on, a, a, on multiple lists, they get transplanted much faster. Here you can see in the blue kind of dash line, they have a much higher rate of transplant at any time point than those who are on just one list. Uh, and also a much lower rate of dying and, and being taken off the list for a variety of reasons. Um, so, you know, your, your transplant center um, will generally alert you that um, that is an option for you um, if that's something you're able to do. Dr. Gibbons. Yes. Um, so would that be if you get listed at another center that's not in your region, like the region three, you would need mm -hmm. to go to a different one? Yeah, so, you know, here's what happens. Um, the heart for right now, Traditionally, um, a, a heart needs to be implanted into the recipient within about four hours. And that's different from other organs like, say, a liver or a kidney, where you have more time. And then the reason why that's important is that generally, say, if you're here in um, Atlanta, or I'm in Atlanta, I'm not sure where everyone else is, but if, you know, if you're in Atlanta, and a heart becomes available for you in Los Angeles, you probably don't, don't have enough time to hop on a plane and get cross country in time to get the new heart. And what usually happens for people who are, you know, double listed like that, you know, so we had a, a number of people at Columbia in New York City who were listed at both Columbia and at Cedar sinai in Los Angeles. For most of them, probably they had they what they did is they just moved to Los Angeles because what they were expecting is that the heart was going to become available sooner in 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 California than it was in New York City. That's a different situation potentially for organs like liver and um, kidney, where because there's not as much urgency in terms of getting it into the donor, you actually potentially could get on a flight um, and go to where your organ is. There actually is, um, there's a company and there may be more than one company now, there's a company called OrganJet that, um, you know, will, when you get the call that your organ is available, let's say you're in um, Atlanta and there's an organ in um, Oklahoma, in Tulsa, Oklahoma, let's say, you call OrganJet and um, they'll come get you, put you on a private jet and fly you there and you'll be there in time to meet your organ. Um, that's still not a reality for hearts, but um, you know, there are enough, this technology that's coming online that may extend the period um, at, at, during which a heart could remain viable outside the body. So 
maybe that's something that'll be coming. Thank you. Uh, sure. Um, so after you, you know, have surgery for advanced therapy, either in LVAD or transplant, there are going to be some medications that you have to take. Um, traditionally, one of the problems with, um, with LVADs is um, that you can develop blood clots inside the pump. And so um, generally, people are on um, blood thinners to keep that clotting from happening. And you may also be on an aspirin just to be extra certain. Although with the HeartMate 3, we've actually seen fewer of those um, clotting events and you know, the, the intensity of the anticoagulation um, may be less there. Um, people are often also on blood pressure medic medicines if they had high blood pressure, let's say before they develop severe heart failure. And the reason for that is that if your blood pressure is high now that we've given you back flow, that high blood pressure can make it harder for the pump to work. And so we actually wanna keep your blood pressure down. And, and that may also, for some people, give the heart some ability to recover function. Um, and of course, I think many of you are familiar with, or those of you who are still on the line that you're familiar with, that um, if you get a heart transplant, the cornerstone of therapy is that we have to keep your immune system from rejecting the new heart. And so we, we, we have your own medicines that kind of tamp down the immune system. And the, usually the three that people are on kind of initially are uh, a medicine called tacrolimus or Prograf, um, a medicine called mycophenolate or Celsept, and um, a steroid, um, usually prednisone. Each of those has, um, you know, potential side effects or things to watch out for that, you know, we can talk about if there are questions about. Um, you may also be on um, an aspirin and a, and a cholesterol medicine to try to prevent um, uh, blockages or buildup inside the arteries of the new heart. It's a kind of a different process than um, the atherosclerosis that you would have in your own native heart. And then there, there are medicines to, to kind of um, supplement, you know, uh, uh, mineral and uh, deficiencies that you might develop related to the, to the transplant or the medicines, uh, iron, magnesium, and calcium or some. Um, and uh, I think that's all I have to tell you. Um, if there are questions, I would love to take them or comments or, uh, but uh, let me just say thanks for listening to me. And um, please ask away if you have anything you want to add. No, I just have a comment. Um, during the, the process that I had to go through, uh -huh. um, the I could just recommend everyone that's going through this same process, just listen to your body. Let the doctors know what is going on with you. Do not hide anything. Uh, Cause some of the medications that is recommended for you, um, for me, my body rejected majority of the, the medication where they had to supplement medications in order for me to have my heart not rejected. So whatever is going on with you during the process, make sure you let the doctors and the nurse know so they can do their adjustments. Trust me, they will work with you. You just got to let them know. And you will know your body once you go through this process. So that, that is my best recommendation for you all. Just let them know what's going on. If it don't feel right, let them know. Sometimes they will tell you, uh, by your reaction of the medication that they uh, know that your that you can't uh, your body can't accept that medication. Now they also recommended me to have the LVAP, but at the time that I had they recommended me that I was already on a peak line. That's how I learned my body. Uh, the peak line lasts for me over maybe about a month or two. Then I had to keep switching it to another place. They had it in my arm. They had it in my chest. I had two in my neck. And then after that, uh, when they recommend that valve, I like, well, no, no, <laughs> I don't think that's gonna work for me. So, you know, if you feel like something's not right, let the doctors and the nurse know. They will work with you. 
Thank, thank you for saying that. Um, that that is, that is. Um, th those words are, are, are right on. Um, and um, just to kind of reiterate or, or reemphasize some things, um, you know, this is a team sport, and and you know, you're the most important player on the team. Um, we, as your doctors and, and nurses, and and you know, other kind of healthcare. Uh, members of the team, we actually depend quite a bit on you saying, you know, whether it's before transplant or LVAD or after, you know, um, something feels a little different. Um, even if it's just a question you have, like, I'm, I'm curious, um, I, you know, I just feel a little different than usual. My weight's up. Um, you know, I had a little flash of something, a palpitation, what have you. Um, it's important that you let us know because uh, sometimes that can be the, the clue to something, you know, really important that we might have missed if we if you hadn't said anything. Um, and and also, yes, if if, um, if a particular medicine isn't quite agreeing with you, um, you know, whatever it is, um, you know, please, uh, please let us know about that. And I think overall, it, it, it's just about improving the communication. And, and I think the better you'll do. Um, the better that communication is. I have a question. Please, go ahead. Um, I've, I, I've had my LVAT uh, now since February of 2020 mm -hmm. uh, at Emory University. Um, I, uh, like the previous, uh, the lady said, I had a pick line as well uh, that kind of fell, and then they I went into the hospital, um, and um, the doctor recommended that I go to the LVAT. Um, so I got the LVAT in October, I'm sorry, February of 2020. I've got listed for a transplant, uh, I was listed officially in October of 2020. Mm -hmm. um, and it kind of stabilized a lot of the things that I was going through, uh, you know, the fatigueness, the, um, um, get, getting rid of the, you know, having fluids in my body, you know, all the symptoms. Uh, I am currently at a level, I think it's a level four. Mm -hmm. um, so with this LVA, it's kind of stabilized. I guess my health. It's, it's stabilized a lot of things I was going through. Um, but at the same time, it seems like now I don't want to be on LVAT for the next two, three years. You know, I, I, I don't, and I, and I tell my doctor all the time, I'm like, you know, my life is on hold because there's nothing I can do uh, um, because of this LVAT, you know, and being on disability because of it. Mr. Mosley, I can you hear me? At the next level, you get your transplant a lot sooner than than a level one or a level two. Um, any suggestions on with this LVAT stabilizing my life right now? It seems like it's on hold. I, I don't know if that a question or not. But it, it seems like the other has stabilized my life, my health a little bit. But it's it's holding my, it's actually holding me back from from doing the things I need to do for myself and my family. Yeah, um, I, I don't know. That's not a form of a question, but it seems like I, I want to transplant like now because I think you know I'm 58 years old and. You know, it just seems like it's, it's a lot that I can, 
that I would like to be doing right now. Yeah. I don't understand yeah. what he's saying. Even if you on the LVAC, I have a heart. And right now, due to the pandemic, and uh, I'm sorry to interrupt, there's mm -hmm. a lot of stuff that I can't do right now. Um, the only reason I didn't get the LVAC was because I had a breakout on those machines, on the pit machine. And mm -hmm. that's the only reason why I didn't get the LVAC because I figured if I'm breaking out and my skin is, is can't tolerate it and I can tolerate the pain, I just decided I'm going to put it in God's hands because I just couldn't see myself living with the other machines to help me keep my heart, which I wanted to so badly because of the fact that I was going through a lot with that pick machine. So that was the reason why I didn't choose the FVAP. It was not because I didn't think that it wouldn't save me. It was because I was scared of the reaction of that machine because of what I went through with the pick, pick line. But like I said, with the new heart that I have, my heart is doing great, but I, it's a lot of stuff I can't do right now. And because of this pandemic, it puts me to a point where, yeah, I'm, I feel like I'm just boxed in. So don't ever think that the machine is keeping you. It's not the machine. It's, it's what's going on around us now that's keeping us from not doing what we want to do. Just be blessed that you're still alive and that you can find something, just find some kind of hobby in the house or something around the house that, where you don't have to get out in the world too much to be around a lot of people right now and just in, try to enjoy your life. That's not yeah, you know, I understand that. That's a, that's. A, a, I mean, I've tried. I, I do that right now. Um, but I'm. A, I've been an entrepreneur for 15 years. Yeah, I know. That's, that's, that's a deep change. No, different businesses. Now I can't do nothing. Yeah, I understand that. I definitely understand that because I used to. I, I'm a workaholic. I like to. I like to do stuff. I was helping other people, so I understand exactly what you're saying. So, but yeah, it's it's hard. It's hard. But yeah. I'm, I just look at myself and say, I'm still blessed. I'm still here. You know, God got us in a, in this place for a reason. So that's I put that in my heart in my mind. And it, you get depressed, you get upset, you get mad, you know, that's the human in us. But, yeah. You know, yeah, but it just do the best you can with your life. Enjoy it while you can, you know, that's how I, that's how I put it. Yeah, so I, you know, <clears throat> Ms. Gloria, again, you, you, you're, you're offering some really good advice. Um, you know, let me, let me just chime in from the medical side, which is that um, I, you know, I, I hear the frustration and, and you know, um, I'm sorry that, you know, you're, you're kind of going through that. I think that, you know, there's, when, when somebody gets to the point of <clears throat> that their heart just can't, you know, sustain them, we as the, on the medical side, we're, you know, we're kind of making a gamble. Now, obviously, what we want to do is is keep you alive and and give you quality of life. Um, the and, and ultimately, yes, we we'd like to have you get a transplant. Part of what we're trying to figure out is um, how safe is it um, for us to have Mr. Mosley, you know, waiting for a transplant without an LVAD in place, and um, you know, certainly if, if it seems like that's unsafe, if the risk of you dying or if, if your life is just truly miserable while you're waiting, um, you know, then the decision often I think is, was made with you is to, is to go forward with the LVAD. The problem I think that you've, um, experienced is that, you know, as you can see here, I mean, it, you know, you're at, you're on a, you're at status four. So it puts you farther down on the list um, in terms of priority because the people above you <clears throat> are those people who are, you know, like truly sick. Um, people who like cannot even leave the hospital because they're on a bypass machine. Um, you know, a variety of other things, but like, so, you know, one of those things, you know, might, you know, 
obviously we don't want one of those things to happen to you for you to move up in, in terms of status like that. Um, I, I guess all I would say is that, um, you know, you never know when, when your day is gonna be, um, you know, it, it could be tomorrow. I mean, who knows? Um, but, you know, to just, uh, you know, stay encouraged and, and, you know, and just know that, um, you know, it, it may seem like, it, it's certainly frustrating to not feel like you can do everything you want, but you, you know, but you have your life and, and probably if they hadn't put in the LVAD, you wouldn't be here to, you know, have those concerns. Okay. So I'm sorry, but but please hold on. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Givens. We really, really appreciate you um, speaking and being here with us today. Um, it, we have gone a little over our time, so don't want to keep you, but um, appreciate so much. Um, and I know that I learned from your um, presentation, and I feel certain that others attending did as well. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you everyone. So um, everybody, 